this evening. Thank you, Vienna. Honestly, as I came in this morning and got things around, I thought, well, I think things are going pretty well. I, I got it pretty well together. And I had all my notes ahead, and I thought, this is going well <clears throat> until we started singing. And uh, it, it has amazed me the number of songs that are about death and life, um, which they should be. <laughs> that is our hope, right? That, that is our great hope. And, uh, but it, it, it strikes me uh, just differently now, right? <laughs> and uh, God meets you where you're at and, uh, and, and ministers to you where, where you need to be. Um, so it, it really is uh, neat to see how God uh, is at work. But let's pray this evening as we, we look at 2 Samuel. Um, Father God, we thank you uh, for your word. It is true. And the promises uh, speak to us, uh, remind us of uh, who you are, uh, of who we are, of our weaknesses, of, uh, of calamity, and, and yet you're working through uh, difficult situations, some that we've caused, others that are just a result of sin. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, you would help us to see your hand at work, that Father, that we would acknowledge you, that we would testify of, of your amazingness before this world. And we would give you praise, honor, and glory for all that you accomplish. In Christ's name, amen. Um. 2 Samuel, the more I look at this book, the more it amazes me that this is God's title for David, a man after God's own heart. <laughs> he messes up so spectacularly. He's like Peter <laughs> in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, the guy is running rampant and, ah, think, and, and yet. Right, uh, that gives us a lot of hope. Right, um, that that God would would use this man. Um, he he sins with Bathsheba. He kills Uriah. He um, despises the commandment of the Lord. That is the definition of sin. Right, we have despised the commandment of the Lord. We can put whatever cover we want over that. We can call it however we want. We can try and slide around it, but we have despised. The commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. And, uh, and then because of that, there are consequences to his sin. Um, and his family um, has challenges. Are they a direct result of, uh, of punishment on David? Um, I think that God uses David's weaknesses that blossom in his family um, and uses that to, to, to judge him as well. Um, Absalom uh, takes revenge uh, and basically overthrows the kingdom. Um, David wanting to protect his people, shepherd his people, not wanting to have Jerusalem the scene of a civil war, not wanting Jerusalem to to be destroyed, flees, all right? And uh, on the way out, uh, he is betrayed by one of his trusted counselors, by one of his friends, uh, Ahithophel, okay? Who is a, a, a type of Judas, a, a foreshadowing of, of Judas. Um, Christ will quote David's words later and, and, and say, why would my friend betray me? Uh, the, the counsel or that I would trust. And uh, David has another, uh, Hushai, who is willing to go back and um, be the foil uh, for Absalom. And uh, so 
they both uh, are the foil to uh, Ahithophel, and uh, they both are, are there. And we come to the end of 2 Samuel 16, and there it says, Now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God. God had given him a gift. God had given him wisdom and favor. Uh, he had... Um, <laughs> helped um, Ahithophel give godly and wise counsel. And uh, unfortunately, in this chapter, what I think we see is we see uh, Ahithophel turn, become bitter, and uh, ultimately uh, it destroys him and others. But um, as we come to the, the end of this chapter, of that chapter that we looked at last time. Um, it's unfortunate, again, chapter breaks sometimes mislead us. Uh, they're not as helpful as uh, they could be. Um, I've been listening to a, a children's author um, this week, um, Brandon Sanderson, who writes the, this great uh, librarian series. But he is... He breaks most rules of authors, okay? He, he breaks the plane. He, he talks to you as if, you know, he's just standing there and, and he's narrating the story and then he breaks in and he's, he's the main character and he breaks and it just, it just throws you. You're, what is going on? Um, and uh, <laughs> he made a chapter break earlier this afternoon as I was listening uh, and he goes, did you like that chapter break? Well, you're probably right. That's probably too short. And so he goes on with it and breaks it again. And he goes, did you like that chapter break? And it's like, this is, this is the problem. This is a, a chapter break that shouldn't be here, okay? Uh, because it, it's, we're, we're thinking one thing and, and uh, we don't see the, the flow. So let me start us in chapter 16 with verse 20. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your counsel. What shall we do? Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he's left to keep the house. All Israel will hear that you've made yourself a stench to your father. The hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. In other words, tell by your actions, show that there's no turning back. You've committed to making a stink. You've committed to overthrowing the kingdom, and, and you are, are, are following through. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And then that great line, Ahithophel's advice was like the oracle of God. Had been up until that time. Um, was it good counsel that he gave Absalom? Well, perhaps strategically, but not morally. Okay, No, no doubt about that. Um, verse 17 Moreover, okay, so right after he's given that advice, concurrent with that advice, as Absalom is doing or is about to uh, take his father's concubines, moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will go, whoops, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. Okay, because the first couple of times I read it, first time, times I studied it, I was thinking that that all took place on the rooftop and, and that was one event and Ahithophel was saying, okay, and then you go and you take your army and you go chase David. That's not what Ahithophel was saying. Ahithophel was saying, you go do that, Absalom. I will go. Ahithophel, the counselor, not the general, Ahithophel, the counselor, all right, let me choose 12,000 men. I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. All right, so he's talking about precision military strike, okay? We're going after one man. We want to scare everybody else off, and then we're going to kill the king. Why would Ahithophel want this surgical strike? Who's the one man that Ahithophel's after? David. David has um, raped 
affair, at least, with his granddaughter. Bathsheba is his granddaughter. And David has, in Ahithophel's eyes, sinned against his whole family. And Ahithophel is taking revenge. Not rightfully, not righteously. Um, Ahithophel has allowed bitterness uh, to creep in. Uh, and his, his desire is now uh, to be as bad as uh, Absalom has been. Absalom didn't handle Amnon correctly. David didn't handle Amnon correctly. Bathsheba's affair wasn't handled correctly until David repents. Um, Verse 3, then I will bring back all the people to you and all return except the man whom you seek. All the people will be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. So really, this is good strategic advice as well. <laughs> not necessarily moral. Not necessarily righteous because David is the king. God has set up the king. Ahithophel, Ahithophel should have taken David's tactic from way back, right? Saul's king. David's been told he'll be king. David has opportunities to kill Saul. And what does he do? Hands off. God will take him out when he's ready to take him out. Ahithophel. What is he, should he have done? Taken David's tactic. Said, oh God, this man, he, he's, he, he's, he's injured my family. Take your revenge. So what if God didn't take revenge? Because God wasn't taking revenge. That's part of Ahithophel's problem, right? God, you're not doing what I think you should do is right. <laughs> You've never said that to the Lord, I'll bet. Unfortunately, I have, right? Unfortunately, sometimes the, the attitude of my heart is, is that God, you're not, doing, you're not doing it quick enough. God, let me show you how I can trip this guy up. God, let me show you how I can, I can put a knife in this guy's back. Right? And th that's unfortunately where Ahithophel is. Then Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also. Let us hear what he says too. And truthfully, that in and of itself is an act of God. Why? Because when, when uh, uh, Ahithophel speaks, that's as if the oracles of God. Why would you seek any further? Right? But Hushai is here. He's come back. Let's test him. Let's see how he is. And Hushai <laughs> speaks. When Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. What shall, shall we do as he says, if not speak up? All right? So how would you like to be in Hushai's sandals? All right? Um, he knows Absalom doubts his loyalty. He's been David's friend. He, he knows Absalom and all the elders have already given their approval to Ahithophel's plan. Uh, he knows that Absalom's confidence in Ahithophel's great. Um, Hushai has got to figure out a way to save David's life. This is where the Mission Impossible theme starts. Yeah, because this is it, okay? One chance. So Hushai said to Absalom, the advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. For said Hush Hushai, you know your father and his men, that they're mighty men. They're enraged in their minds like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Your father is a man of war and will not camp with the people. Surely by now he's hidden in some pit or in some other place because he did it with Saul. <laughs> he escaped in the wilderness for years. And it will be when some of them are overthrown at the first that whoever hears it will say, there's a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom because, man, David and his mighty men, they're going to they're gonna tear into you. And even he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Therefore, I advise that all Israel be fully gathered to you, not Ahithophel, to you from Dan to Beersheba, like the sand that is by the sea for multitude, that you go to battle in person. All right? So he begins to play on Absalom's problem. Absalom was a pretty proud guy. He weighs his haircuts, right? He, he's he's a, a beautiful boy who, who goes around and, and 
uh, is arrogant and, and loves to make a show of things. He's got 50 guys who run in front of him uh, to the city gates to announce his coming. Here comes the prince. Okay? And Hushai plays that card. And so we will come upon him in some place where he may be found, and he will, we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground, and of him and all the men who are with him there shall not be left as much as one. Moreover, if he is withdrawn into a city, then all Israel shall bring ropes to that city and will pull it into the river that, until there's not one small stone found there. All right? Um, <laughs> he appeals to Absalom's vanity. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel. Are you kidding? Has he not been around David lately? No, he hadn't. He didn't realize that David's not the top of his form. It's for the Lord, and this is the biggest part, right? For the Lord had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom, which is an answer to David's prayer. Confound the wisdom of Ahithophel. If he's going to stay, if he's going to betray me, then confound his wisdom. Make it be that nobody answers, nobody listens to him. And God does. God does. Which brings us to this very troubling thought. <laughs> the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Um, like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes, right? Um, we're to seek wisdom. The uh, Bible tells us that in, in a number of different places. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all who without reproach. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Uh, <laughs> so the question arises in my mind is, so if you seek wisdom, how do you know? <laughs> How do you know? Ahithophel's a wise guy. Um, Proverbs chapter 4. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. She will preserve you. Love her. She will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all you're getting, get understanding. Verse 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. There should have been a clue for Absalom. All right? Let's not follow the way of the wicked. <laughs> he's on a wicked path. All right? Um, the wisdom that, that he's going to seek and get, truthfully, it, it's not going to really matter. Because God's going to stand against him because he's chosen that he's against the Lord's anointed. Not a good place to be. Um, we seek the wisdom of the Lord because he can confound the wise, right? Um, a man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. Uh, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. The base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Um, my desire is, is to seek wisdom from above, wisdom that is pure and peaceable, right? wisdom that honors God. Um, and then to check and to trust that, that we're following after the way of righteousness, the way of, of God, right? Um, it, it, isn't, it isn't easy. Hushai's got a problem. He's got to figure out, having given Absalom a whole new game plan, how he's going to communicate to David, he's in trouble. Verse 15, Hushai said to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, the ones who had brought the Ark of the Covenant out, that David had said, take it back um, and be my go-betweens. And he said to the priests, thus and so Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so I have advised, now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, I've bought you as much time as I can. <laughs> Run. 
Do not spend this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz stayed at Enrogal, for they dared not be seen coming into the city. So a female servant would come and tell them, and they would go and tell King David. And I find this interesting, okay? This story could be skipped over, right? It could just say, and Zadok and Abiathar found a way to tell David to get out of town. But this incident is recorded. Now Jonathan and Himaz stayed in Rogel, for they dared not be seen coming in the city, so a female servant would come and tell them, they would go and tell King David. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom. Whoa, Absalom finds out that there's spies in the city. Both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Bahurim, who had a well in his court, and they went down into it. And the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread grain on it, and the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? So the woman said to them, They have gone over the water brook. And when they had searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. So I'm reading through that story. Does that remind anybody else of another story? Okay, so... Uh, Joshua sends two spies into a city. And how do they get around being discovered? They roll up on a housetop. They get covered over with grain. The kings, uh, the, the leaders of the city come and ask, and the, the lady says, Rahab says, they've already gone out of the city, and they go chasing after them, and they can't find them. It's just like, hmm, it's just kind of weird that God's put the same scenario in here yet again. Um, not completely parallel, but similar. Um, now it came to pass after they departed, but they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said to David, Arise, cross over the water quickly, for thus has Ahithophel advised against you. So David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. By morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. Um, and so... <laughs> Here's an interesting question, which usually comes up in Rahab's time, and so we'll also pick on it here. Is it ever right to lie? When your wife approaches you and says, how do you like this dress? <laughs> See, you got to get down to the nitty-gritty, okay? <laughs> Matters of life and death. Um, is it ever right to lie? Yes, Corey Ten Boom. Um, hiding place. All right. Um, <laughs> you can say, I plead the fifth. <laughs> I've never found that to be totally a great idea either. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Push I? It's at least deceiving Absalom. All right? You can read the words that he tells Absalom when he comes back, which is basically, I serve the king, which Absalom interprets as, I'm now the king, you're serving me. And maybe Hushai is saying that, and maybe Hushai is saying, I serve the king. I'm, a, I'm following David. I'm here on his behalf. You say what you want. I'm telling him. All right, but he's at least deceiving in, in being there. He's a spy. Zadok and Abiathar are spies, um, and at least some ways they're they're deceiving. Right? Is it ever right to lie? Um, the the way the the Jews um, worked it through in their minds was. Um, to account, uh, that, okay, that it must be okay <laughs> to commit a lesser sin for the greater good. Um, I, I would find it difficult to be a spy. I would find it difficult to sometimes be a, a police officer. Uh, I, 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 I would have trouble. 
uh, being undercover. Okay, I'm not sure I could do it. Um, however, I do think that there are occasions where God does not condemn uh, the Hebrew midwives definitely skirt the issue when Pharaoh says, why are you not killing all these children? Okay? Um, what is... <laughs> let me just read Henry Blackaby's statement. Um, Most common illustration of this dilemma comes from the life of Corrie Ten Boom in Nazi-occupied Holland. Essentially, the story is this. Corrie Ten Boom's hiding Jews in her home to protect them from the Nazis. Nazi soldiers come to her home, ask her if she knows where any Jews are hiding. What is she to do? Should she tell the truth, to allow the Nazis to capture the Jews she's trying to protect? Should she lie and deny that she knows anything about them? In an instance such as this, where lying may be the only possible way to prevent a horrible evil, perhaps lying would be an acceptable thing to do. Such an instance would be somewhat similar to the lies of the Hebrew with midwives and Rahab. In an evil world, and that's part of the problem, because sometimes there really doesn't appear to be clear-cut solution and that's because we live in a fallen world in an evil world and in a desperate situation it may be the right thing to commit a lesser evil lying in order to prevent a much greater evil however it must be noted that such instances are extremely rare <laughs> your wife's stress probably does not constitute the level that we're talking about here it is highly likely that the vast majority of people in human history have never faced a situation in which lying was the right thing to do. God is really, goes to quite great lengths. Uh, let me read just a few verses. Um, Proverbs six sixteen to 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart devises wicked plans, Feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Of the seven, two <laughs> relate to lying. Proverbs 12, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Proverbs 19.9, a false witness will not go unpunished. He who breathes out lies will perish. Psalm 101.7, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Colossians 3.9, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 1 John 2.4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John 8.44, you are of your father the devil, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Revelation 21, 8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for liars, uh, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Don't think God's in favor of lying. Just don't think that that's it. Telling the truth, truthful lips will endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Ephesians 4.25, having put away falsehood, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Zechariah 8.16, these are the things you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. That may be the key to your wife's dress. <laughs> Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Ephesians 4.15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. He who confesses tells the truth and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Ephesians 4, 25, I think I read that one already. Uh, Galatians 4, 16, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Uh, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, Ephesians, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Um, is it ever right to lie? I suppose you'll have to take that up to with God. My suggestion would be you'd better be really careful. She skirted the truth on many occasions. My understanding was that she said they're under the table because the trap door was under the table. So she literally spoke the truth, but they thought she was 
There weren't any Jews right under the table, right? <laughs> I, 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 I understand what you're saying. And I, I agree. I would struggle. I, I really would struggle. All right? Hopefully, none of us will ever be in that situation. Hopefully. But I can easily foresee where we might. What if you depended upon the power of God in such a way that you spoke the truth and they heard something different? Because he can do that. And actually he has caused men to hear sounds that weren't there, sounds that were there that no one else was hearing. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego maybe could have found a way to lie themselves around, right? What did they choose to do? We choose to tell the truth. We choose to do the truth. We choose to do the right. Kill us if you want. God may step in. And if he does, great. If he doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're still going to do what's right. I, I don't have the conclusive. I have what I hope I would do. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he disobeyed. God punished him, uh, and it wasn't fun, right? And then God had him do what he told him to do anyway, right? Um, if we obey God, we get his blessing. It just isn't promised that it will be the way you think it would be. Christ chose to obey and was crucified on a cross. And yet, that's one of those good story, bad story things where, you know, <laughs> you've got to trace it all the way to the end, right? If you stop at the crucifixion and you look at it from the human standpoint, you're thinking, oh my, he did what was right. God allowed him to die. <laughs> good news. <laughs> Because he died, we get saved, right? Because he obeyed, God raises him from the dead. Because he obeyed, right? Not sure what would have happened if Corey Ten Boom had said. I, I don't know. But we'd be best, <laughs> we'd be best to think through what God's word says, to trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, we'll end it there, all right? Because I've got um, another issue or two that comes up in this chapter. <laughs> but uh, let's pray. Father God, we're glad that you do not lie to us. There is no deceit in you. You tell us the truth even when it hurts. You speak the truth in love. You couch your judgment in grace and mercy. You provide a way. Father God, you tell us the truth. And for that, we are grateful. Not grateful that we're sinners. Not grateful that we deserve hell. Not grateful that we deserve judgment. But we are grateful that you tell us the truth. That there is one who is the truth. The way. The life. That you provided. That we could be set free. We thank you. Help us to live in the light of your glory. And for your name's sake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming this evening.